everyone, Tess Thomas here from Clay County Historical and Arts Council. Welcome back to another episode of One on One with Clay County History. Today we're off the square of Hayesville, North Carolina at the Old Jail Museum with Miss Fanny Watson. Miss Fanny, thank you for being here. I understand you have quite the history of your family being in this area and we we'll wonder if you will share that with us. I'd be glad to. I don't know all the history, but what I have I will share with you. On my father's side, there was a great-great-grandfather, Elijah Herbert, who uh, acquired 236 acres through a state land grant, and this was in 1852. Oh, wow. So, as time went on, he, uh, when he passed away, the property went to his children, and as I understand, my great-grandfather, R.L. Herbert, bought the shares of his brothers and sisters to make it still one complete uh, parcel of land. This was over off of uh, Oak Forest Road, uh, Hinton Center Road, coming down to Downing's Creek. Okay, right. And it went on to the river. Well, in the meantime, when my great-grandfather passed away, I understand the property went to his children, and one of which was my grandmother, Ida Bell Herbert. There were several in that family, and my uncle, uh, Frank Herbert, one of the siblings, bought the majority from the others. So on this property is where I live today, a small parcel uh, I happen to own on Downing's Creek, and I'm fortunate to live on, I call it the family property. Absolutely, that's wonderful. So anyway, as time went on, my dad um, was one of six boys born to my grandmother, Ida Bell, and he became a farmer, and he did not inherit any of the property, but as he was able to do, he bought land from Uncle Frank, so that is the property that uh, is now on uh, Highway 64. If you go to town through Highway 64, you will go through uh, uh, a bunch of boxwoods will be on each side of the road. Okay. And Uncle Frank, back in the, uh, I'd say in maybe 80 years ago, set out the boxwoods, which highlight that part of the road. Oh, that's amazing, and they're all still there today. Many of them, and yeah. the state has taken the project on, and they keep that section of the road uh, mowed and looking very nice. Oh, that's wonderful. I'll definitely look for that now. You I do. Know about it. Yes, it's, it's a nice... That's coming into town from Murphy to town? No, it's coming in from Franklin. Franklin to town. Right. All right, I go to Franklin regularly. I'm going to check that out. It's about a mile before you get to the intersection 6964. Okay. So that's my how my dad, the background on my dad's family. My mother's family, uh, my grandmother was a cherry, and she grew up in the area, and my grandfather... Harry Jarrett, his family consisted of some some of the Smathers, and they came from Haywood County to this area. I'm not sure of all the details, but Grand Granny and Granddaddy Jarrett met, and they bought uh, a property on Jarrett Road, which is named after the family. And the house that they built in 2000. I see, 19 and 11 is still there today. And it is, uh, the people that live there have fixed up the house, or my first cousin and his sister fixed up the house, and today it, it looks nice on Jerry Road. There were six in my mother's family, three boys and three girls. My mother and father grew up in the same community, I'm sure, probably went to church together, community activities, and they married in 1933. The house uh, that mother and daddy uh, ended up putting on the farm on 64 and on the land property, the Herbert property, was moved from uh, Lake Chatoug. When they built the lake, 
many of the houses were removed, farms were removed, or I understand uh, demolished in order for the lake to fill up. I had heard that also. So your family house was one of those? Right. And they moved it? They moved it. And I grew up in the house, and today it is owned by Joe Sellers and his wife, and their two children live there, and they have really fixed up the house, and it's very, uh, I'm very happy to see that it's in such good condition today. That's wonderful. So, yes, and so I grew up on the farm there, on Downing's Creek. As I look back, I had a great childhood, but I did not realize it was such a big world. Uh, my time was spent uh, in the gardens, or I'd go to school, but uh, and I had cousins, and on Sundays we'd go to church together and then have Sunday dinner together. So uh, it was a, a very a great childhood. Yeah, I was grew up close to my cousins too, and when I was young, and then we, when you moved, and and then you lose them. Cousins are your first friends. I mean, yes, that's fantastic. You had your good family and close by. It was. My mother uh, was a school teacher at Hazel High uh, School for about thirty eight years. Oh wow! Yes, she taught Latin. Uh, she taught algebra, trigonometry. I call her a, a very smart lady. I would say so. Yes. Latin and trig and geometry, that's amazing. My grandmother, Jared, the three girls that she raised, she was uh, very pro-educational for her, her girls. So they went to uh, Greensboro Women's College. But the boys, I understand grandmother thought that they could uh, make a living in the wood doing farming or uh, whatever else, but uh, they were. she was not insistent that they go to college, but for the girls she was. Well, they could depend on their brawn, as, you know, more so than their brain, and the girls yes. didn't have that, so that was a great forethought. I often I would hear Mother talk about, uh, she'd get on the train in Murphy with her small suitcase and go down to college. And, but uh, it was different times and during the uh, Depression era, and there was times Granddaddy would pay uh, whatever tuition it was, I think by selling maybe uh, a cow or getting money uh, through his farming effort, efforts that he did. My sister, I had one sister, uh, Dora. She was a year and a half older than I, and she was the indoor girl at home and she enjoyed uh, domestic projects while well, I wanted to be out. So I would go to the barn, I'd go to the chicken house, or I'd go to the pig pen. Right. I'd climb trees. Way more fun. Oh, and, <laughs> and during the fall I would gather nuts and at one time I think I, I was called, uh, I don't know, a some kind of nut person because of my love for nuts. I'd sit on the step of the can house and crack the nuts. That's amazing. And today I still love them. Sure. So uh, after school, I enjoyed school very much. I went to Western Carolina with my high school boyfriend. And during our college time, we got married finished our years at Western Carolina and moved to Atlanta. And while in Atlanta, uh, we had two daughters. My daughters, Lynn is the oldest, and Laura is three years younger than Lynn. So today, uh, Lynn went to Berry College at Rome, Georgia, and met her husband, Ed, Ed Maniotis. And they live on part of the, what was the farm, and she works in Blairsville and has for 22 years. That's amazing that you still got your, your children still on the ancestral land. That's amazing. Right. Well, she is on the Jarrett property. Right. And where uh, I consider, I live on the, the Herbert Herber property. I see. But they adjoin, and which works out great. My second daughter, Laura, she liked to travel even in high school. Uh, she would go on trips that were offered through school projects. 
So, and she had an aunt that lived in San Francisco. So she would go out in the summertime and visit her aunt Sandy. And she ended up going to school in California for her uh, college degree. Once she finished college, she decided to go into the Peace Corps. And at the time, it was a safe thing to do. She was uh, assigned and went to Africa and lived for two years. Amazing. In Africa. And that was quite an education for what her. What an experience, yes. Yes. And she came back and then got her master's at uh, Emory, and that led on into her uh, work at CDC. Wow, impressive. So, uh, in the meantime, my first marriage, uh, Steve and I divorced, and I met and married Tom Watson. So there I have the name of Watson. I see. He worked for uh, Eastern Airlines in Atlanta, and his love and passion was uh, old antique cars. And during our marriage, we moved back to Hazel and built a home. And we kept, uh, he still had his old cars. So we traveled about, enjoyed, and met many nice people through our endeavors in the old car club. Oh, so doing the car shows? Yes. We, all over? Yes, we did. It was uh, interesting. What would be the farthest place you guys went for a car show? Well, we flew. If uh, We went to Niagara Falls. We went to um, to San Francisco area. He was worked with Eastern Airlines, so we were able to fly at a discounted price right. to make it affordable. Nice. But we drove to many car shows, to Dothan, Alabama, up into Hersey, Pennsylvania, uh, down to Charlotte. So many times it was without air conditioning, <laughs> and I was always happy to get home. Right. Because it usually involved a breakdown somewhere. Oh, no. <laughs> well, just take us an hour and I put it right back together, honey. <laughs> So he worked on it. He built the cars himself? No. We, we, he purchased old cars. Oh, I see. We had a 28 so, Nash, and they, we brought it and were in the parade at the festival in Hiawassee nice. for several years. Then we had a 48 Nash and a 50 Nash, and then, then we had a Metropolitan, which we drove to Dothan, Alabama, and it's a very small car. Yeah. And as we'd go down the interstate and the big trucks would pass us, we would just waver back and forth. Like about get pushed off the road. Yes. Oh my. An exciting experience. Sure. <laughs> so those good story to tell. They are. There's some good stories to tell. But in the meantime, on our return back to Hayesville, I uh, needed to work, I needed a job, so I ended up working for Clay County Department of Social Services. And I uh, found that it was a true love. It takes a good heart to do something like that, to, that, that kind of service, yes. Well, I found, I worked with uh, children, but I also worked with adults in uh, help meeting their needs. But it, I found it was just a special calling for me, and today I have taken that love for social service. I worked for 20 years for DSS, but today I'm at the food pantry every Friday. I see some of the families that I was worked with then. Oh, that's awesome. And then every Wednesday I deliver meals uh, to the Shooting Creek route. So Meals on Wheels? Meals on Wheels. For the elderly. Awesome. Yes. So it's good. It gets me out of the house and keeps me in contact with people. I also continue to do social work and I'm a guardian ad litem for foster children. Oh, thank you. So uh, it's it's good. Then I'm with St. Vincent de Paul uh, in regards to helping people who have uh, bills they need to meet and are in hard times and can't make uh, the payment. So it, then I'm active at my church, Oak Forest United Methodist, and I've been there ever since we returned from in 1988. Uh, that's the church I grew up in, 
That's Pastor Tim, yes? Pastor Tim. He had a candlelight vigil um, last year that I went to and, and interviewed some folks for. Um, I, I loved him. He was a wonderful fellow. Very kind. Yes. We're very fortunate to have Tim. And so are you just active in the church, or are you yes. on some type of a board for the church? Well, I've been on board. I've been Sunday school teacher. I'm in the choir. Uh, I lead the, uh, we have a ladies, United Women of Faith. So we uh, still are active as best we can. And I, it's, it's good. And with Bible studies. So uh, I like people. I like to be out. Yeah, it sounds like you have a lot of fun and a very full life. Let's back up a little bit because back, um, I'm not sure what year, but you were uh, the chair or chairman or president of the Clay County Historical Arts Council at one point, is that correct? Yes, I was. I um, became involved once I moved back, and there was a lady, Leslie Carter, who led the uh, Historical and Arts Council, and I started sitting on the board, and I believe I followed her, and there was, uh, I was, I don't know, maybe three or four terms as chair, and we did several things uh, here at the museum, as well as um, inside and out of the building, very active in conducting and seeing that the festival on the square was carried off. At the time, it was not uh, advanced uh, as it is today, and we did things by phone and by letter and enlisting people to bring their... Uh, a lot more time consuming without the internet, for yes, sure. Yes, but <clears throat> it, it was a learning experience and I just uh, loved it, but it was very... Uh, you had to have a lot of planning to put it together. Sure, a little bit of a challenge, right? Yes, you've got to see that the food's there and the, the vendors are in and the publicity is out. About how many vendors... Music. How many vendors do you think you had back then? Maybe 50. But over the years, I think now they have 70, 80. Yeah, we had over 80, I think, last year. Um, I've only been involved with it for two years now, so but I really like it here, and, oh. and, and I love the festival. Um, can you tell us the story about how this quilt came about to be in this museum? Okay. We had two <clears throat> very dedicated board members, Barbara Bussolari and her mother, Ruth Quinn. And I will first say that they were dedicated to the Indian artifacts. They are responsible really for getting the uh, most of the, many of the artifacts in here. We had several, but the, as to the display, and how they were presented, I give credit so much to Barbara and her mother, Ruth. And one day, uh, we had worked, I'm regressing now, we would worked with the Nelson Village, which was a pioneer village up T uh, Tusquity Road. And the ones that brought that village into uh, being, they died or got disabled. And so the, pro the old buildings they collected, the artifacts they collected, uh, theirs was more pioneer and family oriented. So the family did not uh, want to continue that. And we considered some way bringing that village to the property below the museum. After looking at all the pros and cons, we just found it was would not be feasible for us to do so. So I was riding with Ruth Quinn one day. We were coming down from uh, the hill in front of Mel Lano's, and we looked up at the museum, and I said to Ruth, I said, well, what do you see on that hill, Ruth, beside the museum? She said, I see an Indian village. Well, I, it was a little bit off track, I thought, you know, I didn't think that would ever come to fruition. Right. But it was after, really, I think Ruth had <clears throat> passed away. In the meantime, through Rob Tiger and many of the other organizations, it happened to turn into an Indian village. So Ruth and Barbara were very knowledgeable in, uh, and dedicated to antiques. And I had this lady that social service, uh, 
uh, I met through social service. She needed some extra help in her home. She had no family here. And I was uh, visiting her at one time. And she, uh, she said to me, she said, I have something special. And I said, oh, you do? And her house, uh, she went to the bottom of her bed, and she had a hope chest or a trunk. And she started pulling out uh, of this cover, and it was uh, cloth, and spread it out on the bed. And it turned out to be uh, this quilt here that we have displayed I'll today. be sure to get pictures of it so you guys can see what we're talking about. Off camera. She said that this was made by my for, uh, forefathers on their Trail of Tears, that it was made uh, on the Indian Trail of Tears, Cherokee Trail of Tears. So uh, we talked some more, and I was rather excited to see it. And I happened to talk to her, and I said, would you let somebody else in our uh, Historic Arts Council, look at this. And she said, yes. So I got Barbara and her mother and brought them down and uh, they looked at it and they were impressed and they said, I think we could use this at the museum. So I talked some more to the lady and I said, uh, you know, would you consider donating it? And she said, yes, but first of all, I want an article in the paper <laughs> about it. And you'll see the article that... Uh, it's probably on the pedestal. It may be. Debbie Jo <clears throat> Ferguson went to her house and interviewed her. And so, in turn, we did get the uh, quilt. And in the meantime, Barbara Busalara had a good friend that was into restoration of quilts. And the quilt did need some stabilizing. Well, yeah, because this was apparently made during the Trail of Tears, which was in the 1830s. Yes, right? 1830s, 1840s. She said that she had a map at one time, and to her explanation, a map showed who made the different squares. So this okay. quilt is made of several different squares. Yeah, and all the family names, uh, we're not sure who, who they are other than that. Um, what it says on the side of the thing is donated by Betty Arnie McWhorter That's of her. Warren. And it said it was given to her in 1947 by her grandmother, Alice Spidey McNelly. So I'm assuming that all the names that are on this quilt, and you'll see is uh, Charlie and Mother and Leo and Dad and Eileen. And I can't even read all the names, but I'm assuming are there family members. I would assume so. Yeah. But so they, so sorry, they batted, they touched it up. They did. Strengthened it. They did and or, made the frame and ordered the cover. The, uh, the, it was glass or plastic, I can't remember, but the first time it came, it was broken. Oh. Had to send it back. So, uh, but I give Barbara and her mother credit with, uh, fixing it so that we can have it as a display in our Indian art. Absolutely. Room. You can tell that they did a wonderful job framing it and I'll make sure to get pictures to show you all of that again. But this is in our Cherokee room at the Old Joe Museum and it's right on the wall so you'll, you'll see it and as soon as you walk in you can see it. it's huge. What would you say this is 10 by 10? Could be. It's pretty big, pretty big. 8 by 8 maybe? But you'll love to see it. And so she, I understand, passed away. She did. She, uh, she had a step-grandson in Texas. And that's the only family that I really recall. And he came to see her. She, her health failed, and she was in the Clay County Nursing Home. So uh, he came to visit, and after his visit, she had a friend, an acquaintance, and I got in touch with her, and I said, do you know where the quilt is? Because by then, we still did not have the quilt. Right. 
and she told me that the grandson had taken the quilt to Texas. Oh, don't I? Yes. Well, I was uh, apprehensive and kind of crushed. Sure, I but thought, you probably didn't realize. Well, so uh, it turned out I had his phone number. Oh, nice. So I gave him a call, and he's very nice. Uh, was very nice young man, and I said, uh, "I understand that uh, you took your grandmother's quilt to Texas." And he said, "Yes." He said, "I had to bring it down and show it to my family members here," but he said, "It's coming back." Oh, wonderful! Yay! And about two days, UPS brought the quilt back. Oh, nice. So that's the story of how we got. Uh, it's called the cross stitch quilt. Cross stitch. I, mind you, I believe that's what they call those. Yeah, I'm, I have no knowledge of quilting whatsoever. I'm going to take your word for it. I know it's just beautiful though. It looks so soft. I want to touch it, but it's behind glass, so I can't. It looks almost satiny. It does. Yeah, really pretty. Yes. So anyway, we had other projects while I was working uh, with the council, Miss uh, Maple, Mabel Kitchens, she and her husband lived in this jail and her daughter Janet during her husband's uh, years as sheriff. Not all of them, but upstairs was the residence and downstairs uh, was where they, well, and upstairs are some cells, jail cells. But I think they had a wall there, right? So it was separate yeah, right. back so then. There are two different sets of steps here in the jail. One was used for the cell area, and then the other set of steps was used by the family. So, and as time went on, um, we had the wall over there, the kitchen, uh, the Pioneer kitchen was added during that time. And also, whenever we had the uh, quilt here, it needed to be in uh, a temperature adjusted uh, atmosphere. Climate control. Climate sure. control. Yeah. So that's when we started having either air conditions put in the windows or the heating system was put in. Prior to that it wasn't? It was just no, no. Heated by what? A fireplace uh, or something? Fireplace. Wow. While I was here we also put a new roof on the old jail and there were chimneys that uh, were talking with the roofers it was going to be hard to work around everything, so we ended up taking the chimneys down. You don't see them when you yeah from the outside, but uh, we were um, delighted. We had people that enjoyed coming in, and they still come today to see what's in here. Yes, well, this is your fiftieth year, the council's fiftieth year, um, and then the museum. I think next year will be the fifty years for the museum, so I'm sure it's seen. A lot of uh, a lot of people come through from all over the world. Uh, is there any other thing you want to tell us about today, Miss Manny? No, I've just been fortunate, health-wise, and uh, to be able to live to be here today, to be able to talk to you and share this. And I realize I'm not the only one, the na not the only native that's still here. I call myself a native. Sure, of, of course. And uh, we've met several of them in our one on one with Clay County History series this winter, and um, we're going to bring it back next winter. We've had a great um, calling for it. A lot of people appreciated to hear other people's family histories, and so we're going to keep doing this again next year. If you're interested in being a part of that come fall, uh, don't hesitate to email me. My email address is cchachaysville at outlook.com. You'll be able to find um, all of our previous. Sneak peeks from the museum, um, our artist spotlights, and our one-on-one -on -one with Clay County History videos all on our website. Uh, that address is clayhistoryartsnc.org. And we are on four social media platforms. That's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And I just want to thank you all for sticking with us for this whole series this year. We've had a lot of fun and met a lot of neat people. And uh, like I said, we're going to try to bring that back. But Fanny, I thank you so much for coming with us today and, and being our, our grand finale on the interviews for the one-on-one -on -one with Clay County History. And um, is anyone you want to have shout out to? No. no, just thanks for everybody for their support and interest. Come and bring your friends. 
to see the museum because it's here and really it's not much good to have if people don't take advantage of it. So please come. Absolutely. And there's a lot of history. We have the pre-electric kitchen. We have the Cherokee room. We have the uh, looms, the uh, feed sack room. We have upstairs, there are some really old toys and dolls and there's a um, African-American history upstairs also. There is the doctor's office, Dr. Wow. Killian's office was attached on the side over here. So there's just so much. We have one of the first telephones from Haynesville, um, from the Penland, and we have what else? I'm going to put a, a say, please come. Uh, we have the barn <clears throat> painting display now. Yes, that's for June 1st, for our grand opening and, is June 1st. And, and Carolyn, uh, Carolyn's display of carving. Carolyn Anderson carvings, yes. And I'll get a little, little picture. I don't want to show you everything because I want you guys to come in. But um, that's our two featured exhibits this year. So yes, June 1st, uh, the museum will be open from 10 to 4, but our actual grand opening celebration, and we'll have some light refreshments, will be from 11 to 2. So please come in. Also, Carl Moore's book will be here for sale. Eileen is going to tell you a little bit about, she was in, had part of editing Carl's book. And um, we, we lost Carl Moore recently. So it would be wonderful to share his story and, and to show you his book of Clay County, Then and Now. So, a lot of information today. Uh, thank you again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.